Hey, welcome to Guitar Knobs, the guitars, gear, noise, and nonsense podcast hosted today by these knobs. Jared Brandon. Hey, it's me, Todd Novak, and on the line, calling all the way from someplace off the coast of Australia called Tasmania is John Parsons of John Parsons Guitar Workshop, home of Jay Parsons Guitars. Excellent. And specifically, you're in you're in the uh, area of Launceston, so the north part of Tasmania. Long Thurston, Launceston, Lon Thurston, Seston with a Seston, Launceston, Launceston. Yeah, like <laughs> yes. Celestian, but Seston. Yeah, this is going to be yeah. s- the most fun ever. <laughs> cool. Um, now, I, I will say, everybody out there, that I had a I had a, a, a preliminary call with John and asked him to forgive our ludicrous fascination with the idea that um, Tasmania is only a place referenced to us here as things in cartoons. That's right. It's, like it's, <laughs> it's a. Uh, you could not be farther away from us right now, but here you are, so close, That's so right. close. Yep. So cool. we're gonna talk to John about his awesome guitar making and the guitars that he makes and what inspires him and all those great things. Uh, but first, as you know, we're gonna take care of a, a, a few little things of business. We want to. Um, make sure that we let you know that we are now on patreon.com and we would greatly appreciate your support. Uh, We're at patreon.com forward slash the guitar knobs. You can search anywhere on Patreon and I'm sure you will find us. You know, we are trying to make sure that we don't have to put ads on the show. Uh, We're getting to the point where we're, you know, trying to ratchet things up a little bit. And we want to keep it ad free for you. And we super duper appreciate it. That's not really great English right there, but you will forgive me, I'm <laughs> sure. <laughs> so anyhow, that's that's the business end of things. Let's discuss what we did this week in Guitar World stuff. I can't wait. Not Guitar World, the Guitar World, because that's a copyright thing and I don't want to go there. But that's in our right. own Guitar Worlds. <laughs> All right, Jared, hit me. Okay, so I talked about the Harmony Meteor, the Harmony Meteor guitar that I bought for Meteor. Couple, Meteor that I bought for a couple hundred bucks. Yeah, and I it came with some Demarzio pickups, um, the double cream. They're really old and vintage, and people pay a little extra for the old vintage ones. So I sold them on the old Reverb and. Uh, Already? Yeah, for like, uh, what, 100, matter how much. 125 but or something But you're going like to tell us anyways. Yeah, so okay. I got 75 bucks into this guitar, this Meteor. Big old jazz body. It's beautiful guitar. It's got some scratch and nicks or whatever, but hey. Um, uh, I got Tony's uh, uh, Bigsby from him. Put that on. And uh, I also built some pickups for it. I built a Charlie Christian style on the neck, and I built a P90 for the bridge. Although I shortened up that P90 and dressed it up to look more like a gold foil, so uh, it sounds really good in the bridge and and really differently good in the neck. So uh, I'm really happy. Differently with, good. Yeah, differently good. It's it's it just really catches a lot of the natural tone of the body because. It doesn't have very many windings, Mm -hmm. uh, the pickup doesn't, but it has a lot of uh, magnification uh, because there's a little more uh, magnet power than the smaller humbucker version that I make uh, because I had more room and uh, it's a hollow body. So it it's an amazing sound. I'm still kind of playing around with it and uh, I ordered some larger gauge strings for it. I'm going to put on. Is that a feedback beast, I imagine, huh? No. What? Nope. It's not feedback. Is this a little winding? Um, maybe because I, I mean, haven't most, really most gone up bodies, to the amp with yeah, it. Yeah, if you're anywhere near the amp, it's like, you know. No, oh, no, not not yet. It, it's been fairly I loud, too. I might put a Chewbacca growl in there. 
I could. <laughs> I might do that, actually. <laughs> Thing sounds amazing. So uh, I'm really happy with it, and, and I can't wait to put a picture on it on the uh, on the Facebook page. Yeah. Awesome. So New pickups in the big jazz box. Yep. I'm... I'm uh, I'm really, really happy. I can't believe it. Cool. Now you just got to learn how to play guitar. That's all I got to do. Awesome. (laughs) I'll I'll give you a call. Yeah. John, what do you have going on this week? Uh, It's actually been a pretty productive week. So it was assembly time for me. I had three guitars at that stage um, ready to be put together and wired up and strung up. So that's what I did. Awesome. Is yeah. There, was there, did you uh, encounter any new problems or or obstacles that you had to overcome? Um, no. <laughs> that <laughs> hey, was actually pretty you're good. Honest. <laughs> you're like, no, I'm actually really good at this. I don't have those anymore. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Nothing out of the ordinary. Right? Yeah. The most uh, streamlined assembly I've come across. Um, although I did discover that I don't know how to string up a Mustang bridge properly. Really? Yeah. And until I figured it out and uh-huh. then did it properly. So I've uncovered <laughs> the, I've uncovered the, uh, the soft underbelly of John Parsons guitar yeah, it's my, workshop. My one weakness. <laughs> nice. Well, it was a weakness. Now I know. So I did an unboxing on Instagram and I'm sure that the people that were watching were, there had to have been a few that were maybe mildly let down, I think, because it wasn't a shiny new guitar and it wasn't an awesome pedal. But, uh, you know, from the, I got the, I got the box that has a big sticker from the Chicago Music Exchange on the front and I opened it up and it was a power supply, which it was exciting for me because I really needed a new power supply. Uh, I got the True Tone One Spot Pro C uh, S7, super sexy name, and it has uh, it's got the, it's uh, seven isolated outputs uh, with a cool switch on the bottom, so you can switch out from uh, switch out a couple from 18 volt or 12 volt. So it's it's pretty versatile and it's loaded. It's got all of the got all the cables and everything with it it's got mounting brackets for a pedal train that come with it which is really cool it's got a whole bunch of power cables and converter plugs and it was great so i'm excited about that because i the reason that i got a new power supply is because i suffer from sometimes being too cheap (laughs) i want i want lots of stuff but i don't have the lots of money to buy the lots of stuff so i sometimes i have to skimp and when I was building out the latest pedal board, I did the skimp and I got, I'm like power supplies. I, there are things that I don't know on, you know, I just don't know a ton about. Had I done more homework, had I invested a little bit more, I wouldn't have had the problems I was having with the one that I got, which said it has isolated outputs, but in fact doesn't. Um, it kind of does in the fact that, uh, I, I watched a video and they open it up and they're like, it has a, it has a, what they call the bleed on it, uh, on the circuit board, which I have to trust them that, that <laughs> I'm not a, I'm not a circuit board genius, but me either. Yeah. So, but so essentially on the forum, they're like, yep, that's not truly isolated. I wasn't doing it for snobbery fact, you know, it's sort of like, well, if it's not truly isolated, then I won't have it on that. You know, that's it right. wasn't that at all. It was, uh, it was the fact that I was playing and in the middle of our, of our practice set, I, my power dropped to like half and everybody's sitting there wiggling all the, the wires and everything and i'm like it's not a loose cable i died triple check that before and then so we went straight into my amp full power so i was like well okay either it's a cable and i'm not going to sit here and go through you know 12 cables right now to figure this out (laughs) or it's the power supply and i knew that i had kind of cheaped out on the power supply so i was like you know what regardless if it's a cable or not i should just step up my power supply and have a good power supply, but I really I I don't like shelling out money on things that don't that don't do cool things. 
<laughs> you know what I mean? Right, right. Yep. Like, oh, wow, awesome. I'm going to spend, on, you know, $75 on a tuner. Yeah, you know, how do you I don't want to do that. How do you brag about a power supply? Well, it's just, it feels like, oh, gosh, it, it feels like it hurts because you're spending money on something that, like a buffer or something. Yeah. It's like, uh, okay, fine, here. Here, have my money, no awesome effect thing. Right. So... <laughs> Anyway, so I guess the the cool effect is that my guitar will actually sound fully powered, which is pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, you won't uh, you won't break down in the middle of a, a performance. No, but it's really weird because uh, we did a show recently, and we've got video of it. And when I was on stage, I could have sworn I was like, "Did did something just? Did I just step on something? What what's going on? Did they mess up? Is the PA off? like what's going? Is my monitor not working?" And as I was watching the video, I could hear my power drop out by like half, about mm, three quarters of the way through the set. So I was super bugged by, by that. And if, at the time, I didn't know what it was and I couldn't go back and, you know, try to determine what it was because things change. You know, uh, I've added things to the board. I've I've actually gone into the, to the amp and and. Uh, had that kind of, you know, reworked a little bit. And so it could have been a a hundred different things. So when I heard it in the practice this time, I was like, right, I'm fixing this immediately. So I have, and now, now I've got it. So anyways, I put, I put up a, a, a link on the Facebook group associated with this. And there's a reason that I chose this one. And that video link was the reason so I encourage you guys to to check it out if you have any questions about that. I'm actually trying really hard to get um, True Tone on as a guest, uh, but if they don't and some other awesome power supplier wants to talk with us, I'm I'm open. More power tool. I just yeah, oh nice. <laughs> I, I think I just uh, it's you know it's kind of one of the the I say this often, but the black arts. Uh, there are a few things in the guitar world that I feel are black arts. Power supply is one of them because you're like, what? It's a plug. It's got, I plug things into it. Why is it $200? <laughs> you know? I know. I feel the same way. I, I remember being at a guitar show down in Texas, I, I don't know, three or four years ago, the Dallas show. And uh, this guy had these, this power strip and it was special because it, it, um, I don't even, I don't even remember what it did exactly but it was designed for your your rig and it was like a couple of hundred dollars and I'm like man I mean that's that's a lot of money just for a, a power thing and and you you turn the switch on and off once you know mm-hmm. once before you're done and then when you're done you turn it off and put it in your uh in your gearbox in your gear bag you know it's crazy yeah well, anyhow, um, I would love to be able to to dispel that myth. Um, I think another big one that we've called out is is speakers, and we are trying. We're we're working on hooking up the the right interview for that, so we can have a. I'd like to have an uh, as unbiased of a conversation as I can about these things, not just um, you know hawk your product, but like right. let's let's learn the guitar. It, you know, lovers out there, a few things. The speaker cloth really changed the tone. It, totally. It does. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, so that was my super exciting thing. And fortunately, I didn't have to spend $200 on it. That th- This particular one was was uh, 119 And super afford, like in, like the ratings for this thing are through the roof. And it actually has some very compelling technology behind it, and it was a cheap price. So, I mean, can't can't. To lose. me, that's worth knowing that your stuff's not going to fail. I yeah, mean, yeah, totally. Yep, done. Could have been I'll some of my hand built pedals, but probably not. <laughs> 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 Anyhow, um, oh my gosh, it's time for one, two, one, two, three, four on the floor. Yep, it's four on the floor, and John Parsons is going to tell us what his four must-have pedals are. 
And I'm really curious to hear what these are um, because, again, Tasmania is Mars, so I don't know how they have guitar pedals there, which is a a really (laughs) stupid, ignorant thing for me to say, but I'm saying it for entertainment purposes. Har, har, har. John, lay it on us. What's number one? Well, we've got the... We've got this new brand uh, here called Boss. Um, they've just landed. You, you may not have heard of them. <laughs> no, not really. Um, so I actually only have four pedals. Brilliant. But I don't know. If, I don't know if one of them actually even counts. Um, so I'm just gonna. I'm gonna, gonna, gonna tell you what they are. Okay. I might add in an extra one, which is one that I want. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So um, just my tuner pedal, my little uh, the Ibanez Big Mini. Aha. Uh-huh, yes. Which is, uh, nifty little thing that one's um, kind of hot right now yeah yeah it works well it's getting a little bit small. of uh a little bit of play out there um people are talking about it because because of the fact that it's small and it has a it's got a pretty big readout on that doesn't it it works very well for good tuning does so uh next up is the uh sub and up by tc electronic so i'm actually a bass player and so I, I do quite enjoy a bit of octave. Uh-huh. Cool. Uh, yeah. So, so I'll play what, around what, with that. there's a ton of octave pedals out there. So tell us about this one, why it's great and why you like it. Uh, the sub and up, I mean, it has the octave down and an octave up as well as in two octaves down. You can blend in. They're all separately controllable. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. Um, two octaves yeah. down. Yeah. And it's ridiculous on bass. Um, it works well on guitar. Uh, for that like blue box kind of uh, well it's actually got a few different modes it's got um, their polyphonic which tracks really well mm-hmm. um, and you can do chords and stuff and it tracks all the notes oh, wow. um, and it seems to seems to work pretty flawlessly uh, for that sort of stuff and then it's got the, the classic mode which is the monophonic the the older kind of style of uh, Octava. Yeah. Um, and that glitches out a little bit, but it's got a fatter, kind of more organic sort of sound. <laughs> it's got the, the tone print setting, which right. you can just do whatever you want with it and upload it. Um, so I've got my tone print setting so that um, instead of, like you can reassign all the knobs to do different things. Mm-hmm. So the two octaves down knob, I've actually assigned to blend in um, overdrive on the octave up. Whoa. Um, uh, and it's fully overdriven at the halfway point. And if you go further, it actually brings in a bit of uh, chorus wow. on the octave up. That's now, cool. so did you did you do that one or you, or did you download that one? Because I know on no, TC I, Electronics, you you're able to download those too. No, I did that one. Okay, so I just messed around with it and I was like, hey, this is really cool. Are you just going to upload it for everyone else? No. Oh. (laughs) (laughs) I I respect that. 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 That's fine. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, It's more that I don't know how than anything. But yeah, I mean, that thing's wicked. Like, on guitar and bass, like, I I really dig it. It's Um, a cool looking pedal too. It looks all like mod style. Totally. Um, Next pedal is the Green Rhino by Way Huge. Oh, yeah. Uh, I actually originally bought a Tumnus, the, the Wampler Tumnus, and loved it on guitar. I didn't like it on bass. And so I traded it for this, uh, which sounds huge on bass because um, it's got that 100 hertz boost knob. You can dial back in all the, um, all the bass that you lose. And it right. just sounds... I, um, I like the uh, the Way Huge stuff. Um, you just... They're... they're Built crazy good. The the, yeah. the the cases are bulletproof. Big knobs. You know, you're not trying to fiddle around like, well, oh, where is everything? I can't see it. And yeah, that's that's a that's a great pedal, man, for sure. I dig it. Uh, and the last one on my board is the Super Puss Delay from Way Huge, which is just the best delay pedal I've ever played, and I just love it. Nice. Now, I'm glad you said that because it's funny. Everybody that does a delay pedal says it's the best delay pedal. So <laughs> tell us why that's the best delay pedal. Uh, I just love the grungy lo-fi repeats on it. Like you can dial in a bit of overdrive on those. Mm-hmm. Um, it's got the the vibrato yeah. that you can add in on the, the repeats. And I just love that sound. Yeah. It's slight, slightly gritty, warbly kind of vibe. Um, and it's got the tap tempo. It just sounds lovely. 
Now, I know that it has the notes. Yeah, like the, the subdivisions. Yeah. Yeah, so it's got four different ones, and you can actually set it to cycle through them automatically, and it's weird. Ooh. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um. Crazy. With a bit of trickery with the, the feedback knob, flicks through them, but if you hold it for a certain amount of time, it just does weird things with it. Yeah, but I don't play around with that much. What I like about this is that it has, it's got a lot of features, but they're easy to, they're easy to use and they're not um, all hidden and teeny weeny, itty bitty knobs and to get your fingers in. It was like, you know, it's a big case. It's got tap tempo. It's got plenty of fe- features and mm. it sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. That's, those are, those are solid pedals, man. I like that. Yeah. I like that board. Um, you said that you, uh, there was one that you are, um, interested in getting. Yeah. I think I would like a reverb pedal of some description. Um, and the Alexander Skyfi is the one that's kind of caught my interest. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's just just got a nice, like, couple of sounds, um, nice sounds, but just the hold function of being able to put down a bed of, of reverb that just kind of hangs and you can play over top of it. Where are they located? Uh, is that? I don't know. Um, North Carolina. We should talk to them. Why not? They're close. They're, like, dang near neighbors. North Carolina. I like that. Yeah, and they got cool cool looking stuff too. And yeah. The radical delay, the super radical delay. I've seen a lot written about that one. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean they got a lot of a lot of great stuff for sure. Well, yeah, we need to talk to them. Hey, if you're out there listening, Alexander Pedals, let's talk, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh <coughs> it's cool. So the Sky Fi, yeah. Oh, it's a reverb and delay. delay. Yeah. So I mean I've kind of often I'll use like delay just as like a really subtle bed as well yeah uh, so it'd be nice to have a pedal that can just be set for that it's now would you be vibe. getting it in red or or metal no the red sold out i had a look <laughs> <laughs> the red's pretty cool <laughs> it is <laughs> yeah, for sure well cool man that's a that's a great uh kind of board you have going on are you do you actually play those on a on a uh like a pedal train or you just have them just on the ground or how do you how do you do your board well, I have them on the ground at the moment, but I'd like to build a pedal board for yeah. them. Just a mini one. So. Well, you're a builder of things. Yeah, I know. You I should, have you, built a pedal board yeah. before, so I should be able to do it again. But that that whole, how much time do I spend on myself in the workshop? Well, you could sell them. <laughs> yeah. There you go. I get a cut, though, because since I suggested Okay. <laughs> All right. There it is. <laughs> you get a high five every time I sell one. Yeah. <laughs> right on. Uh, so, okay, hey. We are here to talk to you about your guitars and your yeah. your craft. If we think back to several, many, many episodes ago, I mentioned on air th- my excitement because we were, it was early on in the show and I, you know, it was great to be able to make connections with people. Those connections largely, you know, started out here and it kind of radiates, for, you know, outward. Uh, hmm. and you know, pretty soon we're, we're getting listeners from different countries. As I mentioned, yep. we, I got, we got tagged in an Instagram post when I started to listen, I couldn't figure out, I was like, why, why did we get tagged in this post? And I'd never heard of you and I was watching you. I believe you were doing, you were ebonizing some wood, which I yeah. thought was really fascinating. And I was, yep. I was like, oh, wow, he's ebonizing wood. How does, how does he do that? That's really cool. And as I began to listen, I was like, I heard my voice in the background, which yeah. was so totally surreal to listen. To, it, it was unexpected and surreal. And it was just a weird, just a, a really neat moment uh, early on in the show. I remember telling everybody about that. And the fact that you were from Tasmania, which was like, it was a it was a freak factor and and I ran with it and it was exciting. Since then, I started paying much closer attention to what you do and uh, I think you've got a great social channel, uh, especially specifically on Instagram. Uh, it's really neat to watch you bring things to life. So Thanks. I had to have you on as a guest and see what it was all about. So anyhow, uh, John, why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got started in this craft? What prompted you? Um, 
Ah, oh, shivers. Um, so, I mean, I've always enjoyed pulling things apart. That's just yes. who I am as a person. I just got to know how things work. Quite happy to wreck things um, in the pursuit of figuring out how they work. So that's kind of where I started as a kid. Um, did you get in trouble? Did you get in trouble for doing that like I did? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I really, um, uh, yeah, I really made my brothers mad. I took their stuff apart okay. to see what it looked like. <laughs> yeah. well, it's, it's important to the learning process. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, mum uh, mum played guitar and piano and there's always music in the house. So I just gravitated towards playing guitar at a pretty young age. Pretty soon, I think I just got interested in, I mean, how they worked and then figuring out how to build them. Uh, I learned a bit of woodwork stuff for my granddad and then through high school and college that's all I wanted to do was just build guitars and gu- guitar related stuff pedals and all sorts of stuff and then when I left college I went and learned uh, furniture making uh, to just get better woodworking skills um, and then I ended up working in a music uh, retail store for seven years I think uh, just doing repairs, selling guitars, all that stuff, and then eventually, when you, when you were in that shop and you're and you're doing repairs, uh, can you explain like just a little bit about like some of the things that you took notice of? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I always paid attention to what people were doing, um, whether it was the good or the bad, and I think that all that little the little stuff, uh, I think I definitely paid attention to and it stuck with me. You know what I liked, what worked, and what didn't work. So I always kind of draw on that. There's a couple standard kind of ways that guitars are are built. You've got semi-hollow bodies, you got solid bodies, set necks, bolt-on necks, uh, you know, angled headstocks, straight heads. So if you're if you're taking those apart and fixing them, were there any that may that piqued your curiosity more than others or that you enjoyed working on more than others? I think I enjoyed working on the fenders more than anything just because of how serviceable they were right they're just just because you can pull them apart completely yeah. um relatively easily um it just made sense that that was a good idea to make them as easily serviceable mm-hmm. um as possible um we didn't get much quirky stuff through most of it was pretty standard so yeah. you have a lot of uh, experience with like with semi hollows and stuff or, or is it uh, mostly solids mostly solids I guess I'm asking because uh, I love semi hollow. <laughs> yeah, same. <laughs> Changing pots is not fun on semi hollow. No, no. you get you. I try to ask somebody else to do it. Yeah, <laughs> like you. Yeah, it's always a bit of a bit of a challenge. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> totally. Do you remember the first guitar that you, I guess, for lack of better terms, hot rodded? Uh, yeah, in college. College was when I first got serious about guitar. Um, up until then, I'd been playing bass, and I worked a summer job and got my first Strat, which was uh, one of the Highway One Strats, and that thing just got modded to death. <laughs> <laughs> Not to death; it's still alive, but yeah. you know, I just pushed it as far as I could. Did you wear out the pickguard screw holes on the body? Yep, I'm changing it around. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, like, what what kind of things were you doing with that? Like, what, at, how far did you experiment? Uh, most of it was just lots of little tweaks, like you know, going as far as stripping the paint off the bottom of the neck um, heel so that it made full contact with the, the neck pocket. At one stage, it only had two pickups and one knob in it. Yeah, just a volume, and then just a three-way switch. switch. Though, right? Did you, did you yeah. have a switch? Yeah, three-way. Yeah, okay. And it was just the neck in the middle because that's all I ever used, and oh. I just decided that everything else was just sucking out my tone, so I got rid of it. <laughs> when, at what point did you say, hey, man, I think I'm just going to uh, go with the bass? Because you, uh, you said you're mostly yeah. a bass player, right? Yeah, I mean, bass was, that was like grade six, I think. That's okay. when I kind of got into that. What what really inspired the style that you're doing now? I have no idea. Like I love um, learning, studying furniture. It's all all about you know nice wood lines, angles, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then mash that with the guitar world, mm-hmm. um, and particularly my love of 
you know, the offset guitar, jazz masters and jags and stuff. Uh, and everything else just kind of happened as an experiment, really. I was kind of like, I wonder what would happen if I did this, you know, what would it look like? What would it feel like as a guitar? Mm-hmm. Um, and it just kind of, it all just fell out of somewhere. And I don't really know, to be honest, a lot of it was just an experiment and people liked it. And so I just stuck with it. You just kept going. Yeah. It looks like you have a pretty robust shop there from the pictures that I've seen. Um, that I'm sure that takes a while to kind of accumulate. So, um, yeah. f- production wise, h- how long have you been actually at it? Uh, making guitars, probably three years. Wow. That's just it. In that little shop. New yeah. kid on the block. Yeah. Yeah, totally. It doesn't look like it, you know, for what that's worth. Yeah, it all looks pretty good. Man. Um, Thanks. So you have uh, three major body styles that you work with. Do you want to tell us about those? Yeah, so the Solomon, which is kind of where it started. Uh, actually, no, it's not where it started. Uh, <laughs> but it's been the one that has got the most attention. Um, and that's like a, an offset, like a jazz master. And that's uh, usually a thin line. So it's got a chambered body and uh, the signature swoop F-hole. Mm-hmm which is kind of hard to explain, but it is, it's, it's nice. It's nice to look at. Yeah. It's well, let's, let's spend a little bit of, um, let's, let's get back to that. Wait, no, let's spend sure. time on it now because <laughs> okay. it's a cool thing. So on the Solomon, you've got the, uh, you've got an offset uh, body, but it's not, you know, I know you mentioned Jag, but it's almost more like a telly than anything else. And when you're, when you're looking at it, except for the the body style, just in the sense that you you don't have nearly as many switches as a jack, no. and you've only got two pickups in it. But you do you do different configurations for that. Yeah, totally. Yeah, whatever whatever people want. The 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 chamber the the uh, the chamber that you were talking about. You know, typically on a thin line, you see. Um, an F hole or something like that on the top of the body. But what grabbed my eye and I'm sure what grabs most people's eye when they're, when they're seeing it is yours is up on the, the, uh, the upper, the front hip where the, where you got like the, you know, the arm cut out, the yeah. arm cut out way there. And it is hard to explain. <laughs> I'm, I'm stumbling over my words. I'm trying to explain something that you don't see very often, and uh, and it's on a it's on on a curve. It's in a very odd place. It is, but it works. Yeah, it does. And is that a two, that's a two piece body then? Yes. Yeah. So it's got a uh, a separate cap that goes over the the body. Right. So maybe one of the best ways to explain it is you know the back side of the guitar uh, has a silhouette. But in this particular area, the top cap has a narrower silhouette and a place which allows for this space to happen on the outline of the guitar, not on the flat mm. part where the F typically is. So yeah. right on right where you would have like the the the, the belly cut or or you know the the forearm uh, bevel is where this hole is. Yeah. And it's it's beautiful to look at and it's super unique and i'm sure it sounds really cool because really the the projection is probably heading up towards you any kind of resonance you're Mm -hmm. able to hear better i would imagine and that's the is that the only chamber or is it yeah so the bottom half is chambered completely as well this is a two-piece neck a bolt-on yeah it is indeed nice yes well you're picking up your fender stuff and uh, you know the the serviceable aspect of it and i think just for ease of construction that's it makes sense. Mm-hmm. And tone wise, I think I've just always as to whether there is a, a significant difference. Mm-hmm. I just like the way they, they work. Nice. Have you experimented with neck throughs? Nope. It's nope. on the list of things to do, but yeah. at the moment I'm not going to. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Doing well, it works yeah. Now. Doing it doing it well. Keep it going. So then you have the uh you can pronounce that for me. Uh, Aureli. Aureli, yes. Yeah. Which is the single cut. It's kind of like it was actually uh, taken from a, a parlor guitar shape. Mm-hmm. I've always loved parlor guitars, mm-hmm. um, acoustic guitars, mm-hmm. and just love the the curves and the proportions. Mm-hmm. So I thought, well, what would it look like if I made an electric guitar from that? And that's it. Yeah, and it's got that kind of down electro vibe on the cutaway, 
Mm -hmm. Um, One of the things that we talked about earlier on the phone was that you mentioned that it's got, you know, this this Jaguar kind of inspiration. And then you said it's got kind of a, you know, it could have a down electro connotation. And Hmm. as we get into the next one, I'm sure there's a model that, that we can call out as somewhat of a throwback but your guitars are not blatantly retro looking at all they're no. they look very very modern but not overly mo- it's you're sitting in this really interesting zone of i can see what that resembles and therefore it's semi familiar but it's mm. it doesn't you didn't just say oh this is my version of a dan electro or this is my version of a jaguar you know it's it's mm. you've pushed it farther to to be a little bit more unique and, and more signature um that's yeah. that's tough to do we've had a couple other people that that have achieved that um in my opinion uh on the show and i maybe that's what catches my eye and why i reach out to these people but yours on so back to the Aureli real quick so i think what's r- interesting on that is that you've got the uh, you've got a trapeze uh a tail on trapeze, that yeah yeah on a solid body, which is really kind of cool. You don't see that often. Yeah, I mean, that all plays into, you know, the string feel and um, I guess my love of offsets. You've got that that um, extra string length behind the bridge Yeah. Um, to, to play with, whether it's, you know, you're actually playing it or it's just adding a bit of um, something else. Yeah, um, I, mean, but I yeah. believe – oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you go. No, I, be, I was going to say, I believe the first uh, Les Pauls that came out in the early mid 50s yeah. had the trapeze. Mm-hmm. It's like combined with their, their tail, uh, the actual bridge piece as well. That was a bit of a weird one. And let's see. So you, this one, you've got, uh, it's got the same headstock as the Solomon. I think headstocks would be a really tough thing to work out because yes. there's so <laughs> many, you know, that's your signature thing. Mm. You know, that that's what's. At least in the courts, that's what uh, they've deemed as signatures. So, yep. uh, trying to trying to find your own in the, in a sea of luthiers has has got to be really tricky, and still make it very functional, beautiful, yeah. and and uh, I don't envy that. <laughs> I mean, I spent I spent months on that just trying to figure out you know getting yeah. something to look good that still has like straight string pull that thing haunted me for a while. Yeah, I like how it looks because you've, it's offset, but yet the string pull is still straight. That's pretty mm. clever. I like that. Uh, so as we're explaining this, uh, the headstock that we're looking at, it's it's diamond desk, like an elongated diamond with a mm. slight offset, uh, yep. and a little a little sort of hook at the top. Uh, the, the actual the, the tuning keys are, are are offset. So think of bricks. Um, offset from each other, so it's it's a it's a really nice headstock, you know. Nice. It does, it's good proportions and stuff. We're mm-hmm. going to examine the living daylights out of this thing. <laughs> um, so let's see. Let's go to the Gideon. Yeah, the Gideon. So that's that was actually my first design. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the first guitar that I built was actually just a straight off Mustang copy um, in terms of the shape. Mm-hmm. Um, and then after that, I kind of wanted to skew it a little bit. So it is kind of a Mustang. It's got similarish kind of horns, um, but it is offset a little bit more. And up until now, it's kind of been a solid body, but I've just done the first thin line one with the, with the, the swoop. With the, oh, with the cutout. Yeah. Yeah. So that relic one I posted a couple of days ago. Right. Um, that one is the first one with the swoop. And that one, so, you, you know, if you go to your site, uh, and, uh, well, not if you go to your site, but if, if people <laughs> who are listening go to the site and they check it out, it's, you have, these are all aesthetically very similar in so much as that you're showing them in uh, sort of a natural finish, a darker mm. natural finish, almost a walnut um, can you talk to us about, I, I think one of the things that I'm somewhat fascinated by is where, where people are making choices about their materials. So, you know, we had Frank Dimel on a little bit ago and 
he, we talked about the woods that he was using and where he was getting them and, you know, was yep. he using native woods and et cetera. And so, uh, you know, I know very little about what ha- what Tasmania has to offer as far as wood goes, but I'm assuming it's probably more efficient for you to start there. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, totally. Uh, so um, I guess, I guess the, the, the more common species that people associate with Tasmania – uh, is Tasmanian blackwood, um, which is a pretty close cousin to Hawaiian koa um, and pretty similar in looks and other properties. Um, and it's been used in furniture for a long time. It is, it's a beautiful timber. Tasmanian um, blackwood. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and then um, black heart sassafras is probably another one. That's, um, and that's some a of, great some of the sounding. bigger companies name for yeah. wood like I, yeah. I want to have a guitar I was like what's that made of black hearted sassafras <laughs> it just sounds cool sounds yeah. like you got something that's unique sassafras yeah. yeah so that timber is naturally like a quite a creamy color uh-huh. um, and pretty consistent in its color um, but the black heart part of it which is it just stains the, the wood uh, black brown you know darker colors and it's quite a uh, you get the the both the the creamy colored and the you know these striking figurings mm. um through the wood that's actually a, a bacterial disease that oh the wood my. gets that so it's kind good. of like it's kind of like spalted maple but um the spalting is actually uh fungal and it rots the wood whereas this is bacterial it doesn't rot the wood it just stains it so it's still perfectly you know, fine got, right yeah, it's got integrity. Um, mm. It just looks amazing. That's cool. Mm. And then the, you said the let's see the the first the first wood we're gonna we're gonna memorize these blackwood blackwood. So yep. There's blackwood, and then there's black hearted sassafras. Yeah, okay. and there's, there's a few other timbers like celery top pine, um, which uh, is quite a, quite a hard pine, um, but really really nice to work with. And uh, Tasmanian myrtle, um, which is different to the myrtle that you guys have over there. It's quite a rich pink kind of color. Huh. Uh, it's actually a beach, I think. Like it's um, it's it's very close to maple to work with, and in terms of density as well. Okay. Uh, and then hue and pine is probably the other pretty recognizable species of timber uh, that we have here. Mm-hmm. And it's pretty highly regarded, especially in the furniture world, um, because you can't harvest it anymore. It's oh. you just salvage it. So okay, so um, that's a salvage wood then. Yeah, but like they they spent a long time harvesting it to death um, in the lower half of the state, mm-hmm. um, and they just floated down the rivers, and a lot of it just sank. And um, yeah, it just pops up every now and then. All the stuff that sank just pops up and. People find it and mill it up and sell it. So that's that brings another question. I know something that's really popular um, right now, maybe more so in the base world with so many colored woods, exotic woods, etc. Um, aquatic finds, you know, timber that's mm. been in rivers for you know seventy five years um, yep. versus um, something that's just been um, you know cut down and dried, never seeing water. Uh, are yep. the woods that you're using, are, how, how does that factor in? The the woods that I'm using at the moment, I've just sourced. Um, and they're just, you know, fallen trees. Okay. Um, nothing particularly special. Like I've, I've just been working through a big pallet of blackwood for nice. the last couple of years. So, um, I, I've just, just finished that off, so now I'm looking for, for other sources. Um, but there is a, there's a, a company here called Hydrowood, and they um, have established an operation on one of the hydro dams um, mm-hmm. down the west coast of Tasmania. Um, so this was a, a lake that was dammed and it grew in size and flooded some of the surrounding forest. Uh, so at the moment they're floating around on a, on a barge with a special um, a tree grabber basically. Um, and they're harvesting this this forest that's underwater. That's crazy. Uh, it's been under been underwater for fifty years or something, um, and they're pulling out all that that timber that is kind of hard to get, like hue and pine and and um, you know celery top, the sassafras, all the species that people want. 
um, they're harvesting it and it's got a really cool story and um, you know it's good timber do you, do, you, do you think that that has as much tonal difference something that's been submerged for a long time versus something that hasn't I, I don't know I mean my pop uh, told me that you know when they were younger when they chopped down a tree they would put it in the creek and it'd flush out all the sap oh. um, and then they'd pull it out and it would dry quicker so I don't know whether you know the removal of that sap or those resins um, makes the timber respond differently but it certainly helps it dry that's quicker super interesting I didn't know that at yeah. all yeah that's cool what so what are you using for our um, so your bodies are, are black wood what are you using for the neck uh, roasted maple. Mm, that sounds mm, delicious. So, yeah, it is. It smells like maple syrup every time I work on the next. It's great. Yummy. That's making me hungry. Yeah. So that stuff is awesome. Like uh, every neck I've made from it has barely moved. It is just super stable. And good so, figuring in it, right? Yeah. It just looks really nice. It's got that, that vintage tint to it without having to put you know tints on it yeah. so you know it just looks really nice under a coat of oil or shellac or something mm-hmm. um but super stable and um you, i really dig using it your fretboards that's yeah, this, so this is a big topic right now like what it is. we're using in fretboards Let's, oh man when yeah. that that when that law came in when the um new restrictions came in i had one guitar that was uh due to be shipped out to the states um and i hadn't quite finished it and we were going on holidays, uh, and but I wouldn't be back until after the law had come in, and I didn't have any certification for it. I had a rosewood board, and I was just freaking out. So I had to just push that one through like super quick, just so I could get it to the states before oh, no. um, before the restrictions came in. Uh, and since then, I've just stopped using rosewood. Like it's just hard to get yeah. here. Um, it just costs a bomb when you can get it, uh, and there are plenty of other good alternatives um you know I've, i like using ebony that's quite nice but that's heading a similar way so i'll probably sure. stop using that for sure um really interested in the blackwood tech stuff mm-hmm. uh, which a couple of other luthiers i pay attention to uh, have been using it um, and that's interesting because it's it's actually made from radiator pine which is the, the same stuff that we get at the, the hardware store here um, but it's just treated um, in such a way that I don't know what they do to it, but it goes hard, it goes quite stable and black or brown, depending on what you buy. Uh, as a rosewood alternative, I've been using uh, another native timber called Gigi, which is from the yeah, it's an outback timber, so it doesn't grow big. It still grows quite small, but quite dense. It's apparently it's the third hardest timber in the world. Whoa. And what's it called uh, again? Gigi? Gigi, yeah. How do you spell G- that? G-I-D-G-E-E. But it's um, it's actually a, a close relative of Blackwood, Tasmanian Blackwood. So it's the same, is, same is family. Dense, is dense, I'm sorry, as dense as you say it is, Does it? Uh, do you go through more saw blades? And No. It's actually it's quite nice to work with. It's difficult to hand plane, but mm-hmm. um, I haven't had any issues with with um slotting it but it's it's really stable as well which is Resident. the other thing that i like maybe i don't know oh. <laughs> it's like it's got a pretty glassy tap tone like you get the board and you tap it and it's um okay. yeah quite a glassy dense kind of sound mm. but it's it's sustainable which is you know the thing that i like about it right um, I, I bought just from a a one-man operation he just goes out have some timber come back mills it up and dries it and i can pretty much just tell him exactly what i want in terms of how it's cut and whether it's got little bits of inclusion in it or figure well there's it's i cool. think it's kind of special to be able to have a guitar that's that's got wood from one particular place in the world you know generally because mm. you know that you said that that is endemic to australia but um yeah. you know still Australian Tasmanian wood, just like that's that's a pretty unique thing in the guitar world. Uh, yeah, I think just the same as Frank was talking about some of his from some, some of the local things that that he's got coming out of Germany. It's like I like that idea of you know, of the local aspect. Obviously, I mean that our show focuses a lot on that. And whenever you're able to say this is special because 
I know the, I've, I've spoken with the, the actual person who's made it. The actual thing that it's been made out of only is, you know, native to this area. It's like, that's, that's a great provenance for, um, for a hand-built piece. When you're looking at these, you, you really don't do paint. No. You, you let the wood do its thing. Yeah. And I mean, that, that's really just stems from the amount of space I have in my shop. I don't have <laughs> enough space to build guitars, let alone uh, paint them. <laughs> like it's a pretty small shop, uh, so putting in a, a, a spray booth is just not going to happen. Um, right. And I would prefer to work with something that doesn't kill me. Yeah. Um, so natural oils uh, fit the bill. You know, they protect the guitar, um, and and most of the wood just wants to be seen. So the oil just does the job. Yeah, well, you, fortunately, you're working with wood that, that, like you said, it does want to be seen with a nice, you know, just even a standard black pick guard. It's like that's that aesthetic that we were talking about that was sort of like you're mixing minimal, you're mixing figured, mm. you're mixing throwback, you're mixing, um, you know, sort of modern. Uh, those things are building quite a nice harmony in, in, the, in the design. I also am a, I, I love the wide range in the guitar world of what necks look like as far as inlay or not yeah. inlay. And I, 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 on the Solomon, you have one dot. <laughs> right. <laughs> on, it's actually, on 12, they do is, actually. So all, all the renders that are on the website, they've all got one dot just because I'm lazy and I haven't put the rest of them in. <laughs> well, there it is, folks. <laughs> but in the real world. Yeah. Uh, when I actually build them, um, they do have a row of um, quite thin dots. Uh -huh. So most standard dots are like six millimeters or something, like a quarter inch. Uh -huh. um, all my dots are like three millimeters and they run along the top edge of the fingerboard. Yeah. I like so that. I'm still, a fan of that. Still minimalist um, and still out of the way, but one dot is a bit extreme. I would like to do one at some point because my guitar eyes are not uh, maybe what they used to be, but, uh, you know, like Billy Sheehan's bass, having having inlay that is, mm. <laughs> looks like that, where I'm like, there they are. I can see them. <laughs> yep. That would be kind of, that'd be pretty cool like that. Uh, so, you know, we, we went through what you're doing right now. What What is your, I guess, what is your, your you know, near future plans? Uh, are you just going to you know, stay the path or are you, are you growing? You got new things that you're introducing? So I'm actually, I'm currently working on a new model. Um, and it is intended to be the flagship. Um, oh. so it is, actually, it's actually a variation on the Gideon. Um, so I'm planning on, I'm not sure what I'm going to do with the Gideon, whether to keep it or drop it. Um, but it's got the same horns, but it's a bit more, even a bit more offset. Hmm. Um, but I'm actually going with a, uh, bent sides on this one. So I'm kind of gearing up to be able to bend the sides instead of having a solid block that I chamber out, mm -hmm. I'm going to bend the sides, um, and then add in all those little extra pieces like, um, on where the swoop is, mm -hmm. um, add a little bit extra wood there to, to fill out that shape. Um, and then just have a, a center block, like a three, three, five, and then a top and a back, um, and move towards having that as kind of my construction style for, for the thin line stuff. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, so that's kind of what I'm working on at the moment. The idea of it is, is that I kind of wanted one shape that I can do a bit more variation, like just completely change how it looks just by, uh, different pick guard styles and different pickup layouts. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the options of the two different headstocks, um, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And this shape just seems to be working really well for that. And it's kind of where I want to head is instead of having lots of different models, um, uh, really pair them back and just have one or two. Um, but you know, allowing people to just pick details to really customize the guitar. Yeah. So that's kind of where I'm at at the moment and where I'm heading. Um, really, my focus has always been on hand tools. I think the size of my shop dictates that I can't have lots of machines. So I've got the bare minimum and the rest I just do by hand because it's less messy, um, doesn't make as much dust, and I really enjoy it. Heading, you know, as I get skills in hand tools, I'm, you know, 
transferring machine work over to hand tool work. And eventually it's just going to be hand tool made. So that's, that's my passion. That's what I really dig. Um, and oftentimes it's just as quick to do it by hand than it is to do with a machine and less dangerous. Yeah. Well, and then you got a little bit more story there too. Uh, hmm. For those who are, um, you know, we're not doing these justice. We're talking about as, as much as we can design and the aesthetic and, and what what's going into these. But um, I would encourage everyone to make sure they, they check out the, the Instagram, which is JP underscore GW, JP underscore GW. And yeah. you will immediately probably fall in love with um, some of the, the work that he's showing here. It's, it's just really cool to see, you know, these things built by hand and the care that goes into mm-hmm. them. And, and you, when you go and look at it on Instagram, you're like, oh my gosh, that's the wood that right there, that looks amazing. And so you definitely need to go check out the Instagram and, and, uh, what this is all about because it's, um, yeah. it's some pretty beautiful stuff. And I love when, uh, I think you got, um, you got the Bigsby on, uh, on Solomon. Say, yeah. On the Solomon with, uh, yeah. oh man, that is beautiful. That's a that just looks job. awesome. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Big giant piece of hardware on a beautiful piece of wood. There it is. Can't beat yep. that. Really glad that we've been able to talk to you because um, you've you've kind of been a bit of inspiration for me personally anyways, not necessarily mm. uh, through your guitars, though I uh, greatly appreciate them, but you were evidence of, hey, there's somebody out there who's picking up what we're laying down and... Um, and that's, that's been a source of inspiration for me personally. And I want, I want to thank you for that. So let's see, let's move on to our, would you rather, would you rather, and thank you, Jared, for those sultry sounds (laughs) of the, would you rather. Okay. This week we are picking between two, uh, Two pedals that people either love or hate. Right. <laughs> uh, I think they're the kind of pedals that you're like, yeah, I need one of these. And then you get one of these and you go like, what am I going to use this for? Right. <laughs> <laughs> to, to a certain oh, degree. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're staples in the guitar world and they certainly have their place. Uh, I think m- most people, when they get them, it's a little tough to figure out because they are so radical in their sound. And how trying to figure out how to use it, you know, selectively or not so that it sounds like you don't know how to use your equipment is kind of a challenge with these, at least in the past. For me, it has been. So that's where this is stemming from. So our two choices are the Boss BF series, BF, let's say the BF3 because that's one of the newer ones. And that is a flanger, the Boss Flanger. Flanger or the classic MXR Phase 90 phaser pedal uh, with one knob and a boss with a bunch more knobs. So, Jared, what are you doing? Flanger all the way. Okay. I had, Is that because uh, it's purple? No. <laughs> no, no. That's because I actually did use this we i had an original band uh back in the mid 90s when i was a teenager and it was probably one of my favorite bands i'd ever been in because it was we were young and we had creative minds and i i think i used a flanger in about three or four out of the 10 songs 15 songs we had so oh my like gosh that. So I, I got a, a, yeah, I got a lot of use out of the flanger. I did. I mean, laugh at me if you will, but go ahead and laugh at me, bro. Do it, man. <laughs> but, uh, I loved it, man. It, it, I found a lot of use for it. And, um, nice. the, the first flanger I ever had, it was actually built into an old PV, uh, some old, uh, PV amp. I don't even remember what it was, you know, cause I had several of them with the, with the jagged uh, emblem on the front, yeah. So, yeah, I'm I'm going flanger all the way. Okay, a lot of knobs on there, man. Yep, a lot of functionality. The more the better. All right, John, what are you doing? Uh, I'll go phaser. 
There you go. Just uh, phaser on base is is pretty sweet. So, hmm. yeah, that's that's what I'd do. I'm gonna go phaser too because the the funny thing is I've actually knocked this pedal in the, <laughs> in the past <laughs> because it's one of those pedals is just like if it's on that's kind of the only thing you hear. <laughs> it's just like there's because there's no it's just a, a rate knob right so it's like you want it slow or you want it fast right. but the phase 90 is a classic pedal and I, to be honest like th- that boss pedal gives me anxiety because it's just, <laughs> i mean you need a, a a degree to 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 work with that thing i'm exaggerating a little bit but right. there's a lot of there's a lot of functionality on it and i don't know that i would have the need for all of that so i'm gonna go the phase 90 the classic one so there we go that was our show we are super stoked that you guys have hung out and listened to it with us we've listened to it all we hope you do and um i just want to make sure that we uh call out uh tom barazin i'm it, if I'm saying this wrong, Tom, you gotta you gotta let me know. Don't let me keep butchering your name uh, for his executive producer role as a supporter through Patreon. Thank so you, thank Tom. you very much. And uh, to those who will continue to support, we will add your names and all the other cool goodies you can get if you go there and check it out at patreoncom forward slash the guitar knobs. And John, tell them where they can find you all across the interwebs. Uh, so website is jp-gw.com. Uh, Instagram is jp underscore gw. And Facebook is jpgw taz. Jpw taz. Jpgw taz. Jpd jpg what? Bip, 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 bip. Yeah, what's the matter with you? Bewitched or something? <laughs> jpgw taz. Yeah. Got it. Right. All right, man. Well, hey, thank you so much for taking the time to do this. You are 14 hours, I believe, different than us. You are in the future. You are in tomorrow. Is tomorrow good? Correct. It's pretty good. It's a bit cold. Awesome. I can't wait to wake up to that. Right. (laughs) All right, man. We're going to let you go. Thank you, everyone. We'll catch you on the next episode. Yep. And make sure that you... Subscribe? <laughs> yeah. Long Thurston. Lon Seston. Lon Thurston. Seston. With a Seston. Lon Seston. Lon Seston. Well, that's it for these knobs. Please visit our Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash the guitar knobs to help keep this podcast ad free and ensure that we keep bringing you the best show we can. Visit our website at theguitarnobs.com for all of our past episodes, Four on the Floor blog, and other good stuff. You can connect with us on social too at our Facebook page and share your gear and stories on our Facebook group. Also, be sure to check out our Instagram at guitarnobs. Catch you next time.